welcome to another edition of the UK Law Weekly Podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week we're looking at the case of Owens and Owens, and the citation for this case is 2018 UKSC 41. And this week we return to family law and the area of divorce. Whereas previously we have looked at things like the amount of payments that are due after a marriage has been concluded, Owens and Owens gives us a chance to look at the actual divorce itself. To offer some background, we need to look at Section 1 of the Matrimonial Causes Act, 1973. People often talk about the grounds for divorce, but in actual fact there is only one single ground for divorce, and that is that the marriage has irretrievably broken down. In order to establish this ground, it is necessary to prove one of the facts listed in Section 1-2 before the court. Without going into the finer points of detail, these include adultery, desertion, separation, and, as we will be focusing on in this case, quote, that the respondent has behaved in such a way that the petitioner cannot reasonably be expected to live with the respondent. At this stage, it is important to note that in the overwhelming majority of cases, the basis for a divorce is not contested. Even if one side doesn't really want to end the marriage, they will respect the wishes of the other side and, at the very least, don't want the embarrassment of their dirty laundry being aired out in court. The reason that this case is so interesting is that it presents an exception to that rule. Mr and Mrs Owens got married in 1978, but Mrs Owens was unhappy and began to contemplate the idea of divorce in 2012 when she saw a solicitor and had a petition drafted. In 2015, she followed through by moving out of the matrimonial home and issued the petition for divorce that cited the fact that she could not reasonably be expected to live with Mr Owens. It was surprising when the petition was defended, but Mrs Owens was still able to put together a range of examples and evidence of relevant behaviour, including when her husband had been especially moody or argumentative, and even times when he had deliberately undermined her in front of other people. The judge, however, was not satisfied by this, and held that the behaviours described were either too flimsy to rely upon, or were exaggerated. As such, the petition was dismissed, and so Mrs Owens has been forced to appeal the question all the way up to the Supreme Court, where we pick it up. In his lead judgement, Lord Wilson noted that there are three questions the court should ask in this situation. Firstly, considering the petition, what was the relevant behaviour of the respondent in the context of the marriage? Secondly, what effect did this behaviour have on the individual petitioner? And thirdly, taking into account all of the above, is it reasonable to expect the petitioner to continue living with the respondent? There were some misgivings about the way this hearing was carried out, including the time it took and the nature of the allegations involved, but In the end, it was decided that the judge was in the best position to review this, and it was not for the Supreme Court to intervene. Meanwhile, the President of the Supreme Court, Lady Hale, was even more critical of the first instance judge, and would have been tempted to remit the case, but that was not what was at stake here, and so she threw her weight behind a unanimous majority. Overall, this whole situation is pretty shambolic from top to bottom, I've been doing this podcast for more than two years now, and I have never before reported on a case that shows the law and the judiciary in such a bad light. Let's start with the original hearing where the divorce petition was defended. This is such an unusual occurrence that it should have immediately put the white male judge, Robin Tolson QC, on alert, but instead the hearing would only last half a day. At this stage, and given that the vast majority of such petitions go through without much of a second thought, it would be reasonable to assume that the Owens case would follow the same pattern. Instead, the evidence was deemed too flimsy, despite the fact that this husband is accused of being controlling, and the very nature of this case is basically him trying to force his wife to remain married to him. What evidence do you actually need given that premise? Furthermore, the idea that you can hope to understand the nuanced nature of a 30-year marriage between two people you have never met within half a day is absurd, and as Lady Hale points out, the nature of the allegations, i.e. undermining and belittling behaviour, is not something that boils down to one or two key incidents, but instead grows and evolves over extended periods of time. 
To expand on this point, the obvious contrast would be cases of adultery or physical abuse where a judge would have little choice but to allow a divorce. This, however, only highlights another significant issue with the entire process involved in this case, as what Mrs Owens is describing is akin to psychological abuse, but it is clear that the rules of evidence mitigate against this kind of investigation taking place, and the system is not designed to assist with the recognition of such abuse when it is not as obvious as other forms of abuse. Another fundamental problem is the application of the three-part test that we mentioned earlier. In particular, the third part requiring an evaluation as to whether the petitioner should have to continue living with the respondent takes into account both objective and subjective elements, but this is madness. When we are talking about marriage in this context, it is simply the formalisation of an intimate relationship, and whether one person decides to walk away from that relationship is their choice, and as such there is no place for what the reasonable man thinks. Forcing two people to remain married because you have not been able to persuade some random high court judge otherwise feels like a throwback to Victorian morality, and the fact that this takes place in a public forum is unbelievably dehumanising. Judge Tolson QC at the first hearing had little choice in this matter, but it's hard to know why the Supreme Court were unable to see through this and impose a test that is wholly subjective instead. I think there might be a human rights argument here as well, and although there are a few articles of the convention that could be said to apply, I want to focus on Article 8, which is the right to private and family life. Traditionally, this is associated with cases where the state unjustifiably interferes with a family, or more generally the right to privacy, but I think it can be expanded in this context to situations where legislation is passed by the state to prevent people living in the family setup of their choosing. It could be argued that this is comparable to gay marriage where the European Court has limited the application of Article 8 and left states with a greater margin of appreciation, but I don't think that is fair. In those cases, the claimants are asserting their right to a specific status, i.e. married, but the status of being divorced is not quite the same thing. It is better described as an absence of the status of being married. In basic terms, a divorced person is not in much different, if any, a position to someone who is single. Therefore, the right to be divorced is really the right not to be subject to a status that no longer applies, the right not to have to live with someone who you do not love, and the right to live your personal life such that it won't be subject to unreasonable interference by the state. The only silver lining in this situation is that reform may be on the way thanks to the possibility of no-fault divorce. As the name suggests, that would allow for a divorce without the petitioner having to demonstrate in court that they have been wronged in some way by the other side. Not only would this mean that absurd situations like we saw in Owens and Owens could never be repeated, but also it would finally bring the UK in line with other common law countries like Australia and Canada. While much of the research on this subject focuses on divorce rates, I think that of much more importance is the impact on actual divorces themselves. In a recent article for Family Law, the Chief Executive of National Family Mediation, Jane Roby, suggested that if there is no fault, then the divorce procedure is less likely to be acrimonious, and that is not only likely to help with the proceedings themselves, but also the aftermath of the divorce, including the parties and any children. The sooner the law in this area is changed, the sooner we can become part of the 21st century and stop forcing people to remain married to each other. Well, thank you very much for tuning into this episode, and thanks as ever to bensound.com. A quick reminder, if you are maybe a new law student who is tuning in for the first time or you've just recently started listening, then if you go to my website, uklawweekly.com, then you can get a free ebook which gives you advice on how to answer problem questions. And I've had some really great feedback on that. So um, at the worst case, you're not spending any money to get it. So go to the website and it's on the homepage. That's uklawweekly.com. Right, I'll be back with another episode next week, but in the meantime, bye!